Hello, Houston. We're going to start another section today, and we're going to start with a quiz. No need waiting for you to do the reading. We'll just start right in with a quiz. Um, what movie does this picture come from? What movie? I think I may have finally dated myself. Go ahead. Beach Blanket Bingo? No. It's almost that far back. It's almost that far back. Maybe I have dated myself. This at the time was such a magnificent example. I'm going to have to change it, I guess. Does love story ring a bell? Love story, okay. Right on the tip of your tongue, right. Okay. And the next one. Jaws. What was the major motive in, the, in love story? Love, yes. You need to get on microphone to get credit for this. And Jaws, what's the major motive in Jaws? Sharks. Not sharks, that's the subject. What's the motive? Fear. Fear, yes, of course, fear. Or not eaten, yeah, either way. Okay, next slide. What movie does this one come from? The Graduate. See, once you get into this, these aren't so hard to do, are they? What's the major motive here? Mrs. Robinson. <laughs> He's right. Speak for yourself. What's the major motive here? Sex, yes. Sex, of course. So in essence, in, in, in movies, we see a lot of sex. We see a lot of, uh, a lot of different motives. Grand Prix was a, an, an auto racing movie about achievement. The Love Machine was another example of a sex movie. Um, you may have seen a really neat older film, Flight of the Phoenix, which was an interesting film about hunger as the, as the, as the driving motive. Or a little bit closer to home, if you just listen, you may hear conversations that also involve motivation. Either he or she may be the one who says, oh, not tonight, dear, I'm too tired. That's, I guess, the absence of motivation in that case. Or the next one. Linda mowed the yard this afternoon and came in and drank three beers. She must have really been thirsty. Another motive. Or the next one, one of my all-time favorites. I'm Nancy. Fly me to Miami. I'll fly you like you've never been flown before. Interestingly enough, that was the ad campaign for an airline, Northeast Airlines, up on the East Coast, and that was the first target of the National Organization for Women where they won. They protested the obvious rank sexist nature of, the, of that appeal, and they actually convinced the airline through letters and protests and petitions and everything else to actually change the ad slogan. Um, so they did ultimately win, but clearly sex is the target there. And then finally, Taking the SAT test is an, is an appeal to, to um, achievement. So in essence, even in everyday conversation, um, we come back to the, the presence of, of, of motives quite a bit in our, in our everyday activity and, and um, uh, everyday life. So in essence, what I'm going to suggest is that we, um, that we, that we look at, um, first of all, why we even have a concept like motivation. And one of the answers has to do with the fact that there are multiple causes of behavior that we really need to, to uh, talk about. So, so far, I'm going to argue that we've looked at heredity and things inherited. We've also looked at the role of environment. So up through about the middle of the sensory processes, we were dealing primarily with inheritance as the factor. Um, the rest of perception, all of learning and memory, all of language communication, involved learning as the key role. And now, in essence, I'm going to suggest that the third element that we also need to understand in order to really do a good job of predicting your behavior is something about your motivation, what's, what's activating you at this particular moment. So I'm going to suggest that each of those, we need information about your inheritance, your heredity, your past experience, and your momentary state of arousal if we want to do a very good job of trying to predict your behavior. So this is the third, the last major internal variable that we really need to know something about if we're going to predict things about your, about your behavior. That being the target then, there's a second way, a reason in which we, um, as to why we use a concept like motivation, and that has to do with explaining certain evolutionary needs. Uh, for instance, hunger, you know, once we solve it, makes us feel real good. But if you actually think about hunger from, from an evolutionary point of view, the primary reason why you and I get hungry uh, is to take in the energy to make sure that we survive long enough to produce the next generation. So though we always think of it as an individual problem, in fact there's an evolutionary reason why we get hungry, and it is, it is essentially to make sure that we preserve ourselves and have enough energy to, to carry on with uh, furthering the species and so forth. The urge to mate, 
uh, our reactions to pain, food seeking, parental assistance when that's rendered. All of those are examples of motivationally driven things that impact our behavior and have an evolutionary uh, basis. A third factor is, is that motivation can explain variations in behavior. When you get up uh, tomorrow morning, you may do something very differently than what you'll do when you get up a week from tomorrow morning. Part of that may have to do with simply motivational changes within you. You've got different needs tomorrow morning than you're likely to have operating a week from now. So there are variations within individuals, but there are also variations between us. That is, what I do when I get up tomorrow morning may differ very significantly from what you do tomorrow morning. And that may be just a motivational difference between what's driving me when I get up in the morning as opposed to what's driving you. So there are several different explanations for the variations in behavior that are essentially motivational at base. A third has to do with basically the, the behavioral properties of the, uh, of the manner, or I should say the fourth element, has to do with the, the various behavioral properties that show up. For instance, one of the things that motivation does basically is to energize us. It essentially assumes that we are behaving, at least partly, because we're motivated. We are driven or urged to, to behave in a particular way. The implication being that without motivation, there wouldn't be behavior. If there's no need that we have particularly to solve at a given point, there's no reason to be behaving at all. So it energizes our, our behavior. A second thing that, it, that motivation also explains is the vigor or the efficiency of, of our behavior. Um, weak stimuli, in some cases, can produce very strong responses in you and I. If we've been trying to catch somebody's attention in a class, and all of a sudden yesterday he or she looked at us a little longer than was necessary or talked to us a little longer than was really necessary, that may kick off weeks of additional behavior on our part to attract yet additional attention. Um, so that in some cases, motivation is necessary to explain the magnitude of a, of a behavior relative to the relative weakness of, of the precipitating uh, stimulus originally. It also explains the direction of behavior in certain ways. That is, we are directed sometimes to, to one kind of a cola machine rather than another kind because of personal preferences. But that's a motivational factor to a certain extent directing our behavior. Fourthly, I've already talked about the role of motivation, so I'm not going to comment on it anymore. Um, but in essence, the, um, that is essentially a motivational factor impacting our behavior. And finally, though you might not think of it, actually weakening behavior is another function of, of, of motivation. Um, it is one thing to get us to start eating. It's quite a different but equally important thing to get us to, um, to stop eating. So in some cases, the motivational factors are going to be cited for the purposes of eliminating or reducing or stopping a, um, a behavior. Now, when we look at the concept itself, the definition is on the, on the screen and it's also in the book, so I'm not going to burden you with reading it or spending a lot of time on it, but it identifies the key elements of what we're going to be talking about. Um, I think it may be more beneficial to actually look at it in terms of considering that, op that, that motivation can be defined or considered as an intervening variable. So I'm going to suggest that there are a number of different independent variables which we can manipulate, which will in turn create a motivated state. Um, things like environmental conditions, the fact that you get hot and work to cool yourself down when the temperature goes up, that's an environmental condition that impacts us. Inherited tendencies, experience, deprivation, all of those can impact um, the way in which we behave in any given situation related to what is, what is motivating us. So that the motivation I'm going to suggest is caused by any of these different factors, any one of which we can manipulate. And motivation in that sense then is clearly an intervening variable. And in the same way then, we can measure it using dependent variables, such as the ones that are listed here. And we're going to talk at least some about each of those at various times over the next um, several lectures. So that in essence, just like learning, motivation is something we don't see. We know what causes it, we know what results from it, but we don't necessarily see it directly. Uh, in, not, it isn't even necessarily, we don't see it, period. Um, we, we, we have to externalize it in one way or another. One of the other things that I think is instructive about, um, about motivation is the fact that it operates in a cyclical manner. That is, you are always somewhere on the circle that I am about to describe for you relative to any of your uh, motives. If we take hunger as an example, if you haven't eaten in quite a while as you're viewing the tape, then in fact you're in a deprived state at the moment. You're, you're, in, you're under what is called deprivation. You haven't had food in some period of time. What happens then is, that you begin to sense a need. So the deprivation essentially leads to a need state. These two are examples of what are called precipitating conditions. That is, these are what lead up to or initiate the, the sequence of motivated behavior, which I'm in the midst of describing here. The need, in turn, 
yields drive stimuli and options. How do you know when you're hungry? What does your body tell you? What signals does it send to you? Stomach. On the microphone. Stomach growls. Stomach growls, yes. Like you're growling. Yes, the stomach growls. What else? There's some others. You might get a headache. You might get a headache. Some report that. Trembles. Feel weak. You may feel weak. All of those are examples of what I'm going to call here drive stimuli. That is, they are cues that are, that are activated in your body when you get hungry. Okay? And in turn, what happens then is that those drive stimuli lead to several different options. In other words, there are things you can do to try and solve the problem of, of the encroaching hunger in your body. Some of them are unlearned. If you're hungry and I slap down a delicious piece of, of your favorite kind of meat or vegetable right in front of you, you're helpless. You're going to start salivating. Okay? That's an unlearned response, but it is in fact instrumental to solving the problem. That is, it moves you toward being able to take in and then digest the food. So essentially, salivation is an unlearned response. There are, of course, times like Thanksgiving morning when you salivate many hours ahead of when it's actually necessary. That's a learned response, which isn't particularly adaptive, but it does get you ready to consume the turkey later. On the other hand, knowing that if you're thirsty, you can go to a Coke machine here on campus and put many, money into it um, is a learned behavior. A hundred years ago, if somebody were hungry, you, they would have thought you were goofy if you walked over to a metallic object and started slapping coins into it. It didn't exist at that time. So that's an example of a learned behavior that we have developed over the years to respond to thirst or hunger in the instance of candy machines and so forth. So these two are basically the internal results of, of hunger. These, these are the, the follow-on um, features that happen. That is the drive stimuli and then the, the uh, learned and unlearned behaviors that those stimulate. At some point, if it's successful, this leads to the goal object, in other words, food. It isn't enough if you're hungry to find food. The sixth element is that you also have to consume it. Okay? You have to engage in some kind of consumatory beha behavior, drinking if you're thirsty, eating if you're hungry, and so forth and so on. These last two, then, are essentially what are called goal-related activities. They happen only once you have gotten to the, to the goal itself. And so, in essence, my point is that, first of all, all of our motives operate on this cycle. The point being that at any given time, relative to each motive that you respond to, you are somewhere on that cycle all the time. Okay? And beyond that, it gets even more complex because there are interactions between cycles. Example, if you eat an ice cream cone, what's the next thing you want? Another ice cream cone. Now, what do you normally want after an ice cream cone? I'm going to wait. I don't believe this. <laughs> what do you want after an ice cream cone? Ice cream increases your thirst. Yes, thirst, of course. So that in essence, in some cases, solving one cycle or, or one motive in turn annoys or aggravates or precipitates activity in another one. So there is an interaction somewhat complex between these different cycles. I'm going to have to take you guys out and treat you to ice cream, clearly. This, this is a clear deficit in your behavior. <laughs> we need to work on this. I'm going to have to simplify the homework assignments. Go to ice cream store. <laughs> okay. Now, in terms of getting into our discussion of motives, what I'm going to suggest is that there is a continuum of motives, uh, and, and it will allow us to organize the way in which I want to, to present the information that we're going to talk about. I'm going to suggest, first of all, that we have some motives that are what we would call physiological motives. These are motives which are basically, first of all, inherited, Secondly, very specific in terms of what their needs and what the, what the appropriate goal states are. Okay? They result from basic tissue needs such as hunger or thirst. They tend to have very specific goal objects and they're usually inherited. Okay? That's true of the physiological motives and the only two that I know of that are purely physiological are hunger and thirst. We then have what I'm going to call mixed or uncertain motives. These are partly physiological and partly environmental. And those include motives like these. Pain, for instance, as we're going to see when we look at it, is, is very heavily involved in physiology. But I will show you that learning does play a role on how we react to, uh, to pain also. Sex is obviously a mix of physiology and experience, all the way up to affection which does have pri a primary learning function involved in it, but there are also some physiological urges that are involved in, in expressing affection, too. 
And finally then, the last group that I'm going to talk about or, or identify here are what are called psychological motives. Those are ones that are purely learned. When you get to something as extreme as an example of psychological motives as, as social approval, you're dealing with a motive that doesn't have a physiological bone in it anywhere. It is entirely a learned example of, of motivating behavior. Down at the other end there, there is somewhat of a problem. I, mean, I put aggression under the learned motives, under the optimistic thought that we have learned to be nasty to each other and maybe someday we can educate ourselves to be nice to one another. There are others who would argue, however, that you and I are just naturally inclined, that we inherit the tendency to be vicious and aggressive toward one another. I prefer to take the more optimistic view that it's a learned motive, but, but it is an argument uh, I should acknowledge. Okay. Um, as we get into looking at the history and, and theories of psychology, I want to start with a problem for you. I want those of you who are female to consider the following. Would you be likely to accept a date with a fellow human about whom you knew his skin was red, white, and blue, who spent most of his time approaching you on the street and walking away from you, turning to look over his shoulder to see whether you were following him while he did a dance that could best be described as a cross between a Charleston and a hustle. Would you actively seek to date somebody like that? I would like those of you who are male to consider the following. Would you be likely to seek a date with a fellow human about whom you knew her skin is gray, she has a fat protruding belly, she's a lousy housekeeper, and she has a history of deserting her male companion? In the last class, one person said, tell me more, and the other said, is she rich? <laughs> but the point is that what I have just described without any additional attributes like money or, or corp corpulence is um, the ideal date for another species. We'll get to that story in a little bit. But in essence, what I want to look at here now is essentially some of the early work that kind of brought motivated behavior back into psychology. What happened, interestingly enough, was that back around the turn of the century, psychologists started studying motivated behavior, and they did so basically in terms of what we now call instincts. Okay? That was really the, the, the basic term that was used to apply to what now we would call motivated behavior. You'll remember that an instinct is a response pattern that is complex, unlearned, present in all normal members of a species, and constant in form. Okay? When people first started studying instincts, the list of such instincts grew and grew and grew. William McDougall, back around the turn of the century, published a paper in which he advocated that there are 12 basic instincts with a cognitive element, a primary emotion, and an impulse to act. And he identified 12 that he thought were the basic motives and published. Immediately, of course, when any time you say there are X number of anything, people are going to find another one, X plus one. Well, people pressured McDougall for quite a while in the literature, and eventually he kind of threw up his hands and said, okay, there are 18 basic motives. And as soon as he did that, he essentially opened a Pandora's box, because pretty soon another author with apparently serious intent wrote a paper about 100 basic motives. And the problem there was that we were into what's called reification, that is explaining by naming, which really isn't science. And the net result was that, that kind of by mutual agreement, the study of instinct just slipped out into the, um, slipped out into the horizon and was not a major part of, of psychology. Um, and the result was that when we look at Clark Hall's theory of drive reduction a little later, he does talk about habit and drive. Motivation was part of that theory, but it was a very ancillary role, and, and the relationship between that and drive were, were quite, uh, quite subtle. Operant conditioning ignored it entirely. They just said, you know, you and I are a black box. We don't care what's going on inside. All we have to do is change the external environment, see how the behavior changes. They didn't need a concept like motivation per se. So it was actually the ethologists uh, who brought us back to, to the study of, um, of instinct. And this happened back around the middle of the century when the ethologists kind of arrived on the scene. And they got into psychology in a rather interesting way. They were about the business of trying to come to an understanding of the underlying physiology for instinctive behavior. Instincts were alive and well in, in biology, and, and what they were looking for was trying to understand automated behavior, the presumption being that there'd be an easier to identify physiological basis for anything that happens in you and I automatically. And so they set about to study that. We've already looked at two examples of the ethologist's work. One was the um, um, imprinting of ducks and geese 
The second was the communication system of bees. And this, the third one we're going to talk about today, is the, is the mating behavior of the three-spined stickleback fish. That was work conducted by Tinbergen um, in the mid, around the middle of the century. And Tinbergen and um, um, his colleagues, von Frisch and Lorenz, were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1973 because of their work with the, uh, the three-spine stickleback fish. Now, gentlemen, as I tell you this story, I want you to keep in mind the amount of abuse that is heaped on the male stickleback fish. Just listen up to what this fish has to do. First of all, our first slide will show you what the stickleback looks like, and it's pretty obvious why it's called a, um, uh, a three-spined stickleback fish. Um, the first thing that stickleback fish does is to establish a territory. Now, how do we know a fish has established a territory? How can you make a statement like that? What defines the outer border for that territory, operationally? Hmm. <laughs> Other fish don't go in that area. Okay. That's the negative way to define it. The positive way would be where the fish does go, but the, the implication is essentially the same. In essence, where that fish goes kind of defines his or her version of the territory. Certainly, the inner boundary would be defined by where other fish are not allowed to go. Whether they go or not is up to fight, but the point at which the fish will stand and defend or swim and defend um, is the inner border of that, uh, of that territory. The male has to establish a, um, a territory. The next thing that happens is, that, whoops, I meant to go to the slide, not to PowerPoint. I got too many buttons up here is my problem. Um, the next thing that happens is that the male has to build a nest. And what that male does in, in the soft sands of the North Sea is to dig a shallow depression in the, um, in the ocean floor and then collect a whole bunch of sticks and pile them over the depression and then it gets over the nest and exudes a, substance, a sticky substance from its stomach, which settles down onto the sticks so that the whole thing is congealed into a nest that won't go anywhere. Okay? It's, a, it's a shotgun bungalow, basically. You can drive right through, but in, it's a, a very definable nest. While this has been going on, while the male has built the nest, the male's color has also changed. And so the net result is that where he started this as a sleek gray fish, by the time he's done, he is a sleek red, white, blue, and gray fish. He ends up with a red belly and very distinct white and blue stripes going down the top center of his back. If another fish like that, if a red, white, blue, gray fish shows up, there is an instant fight and a major one. The ethologists, as a side issue, got interested in what might be causing that, and they cut out cardboard models that look like the, the fish that you can see there. Uh, and what they did was to isolate color. So they had models that had red on the bottom or top, white on the bottom or top, and blue on the bottom or top. And, and they isolated each color in its position. And what they found was that the red belly is what elicits the, the attack. So any other red-bellied fish, independent of whether it has blue and white on the back, will elicit uh, attack. That's the sign of another male, obviously. Now, the male has to go out and find a mate. And so the net result is that it now has to go out and find a fat-bellied gray fish. To court that fish, what, that, what, the, what the male does is to swim into her face and then dart to the side, doing a very complex kind of dance. And what he's doing is moving back toward the nest. But if she doesn't follow, he then cycles right back around, gets in her face again, and may dart off to the other side. But in fact, he will cycle back around uh, over and over, swimming at her and then darting off to the side. Unless she follows, he will keep doing that. So she's stuck with him, basically. The male now, once the female locks on and decides, okay, I'll follow you, I'll follow you, enough. The male now swims back to the nest. So the male has to lead the, um, has to lead the way back to the, um, back to the nest. He then swims through the nest to show the female how to get into the nest. She will then stop when she goes through the nest. He then races around to the back door to tickle her tail so that she will deposit the eggs in the depression in the bottom of the nest. Now, this is hot sex that I'm describing here for a stickleback, okay? She then, classic example, leaves. He goes in, fertilizes the eggs. Somebody is left to keep the ocean currents fanning through the, um, through the nest, keep the currents flowing so stuff doesn't settle on the eggs before they can hatch. you know who's left to do that? The male. Yes, the male. The net result is that a protest group has been formed in, in, the, in the North Sea called the Male Stickleback, the Stickleback Male Liberation Movement, the SMLM. 
Um, it is a protest group against the rank sexist life that male sticklebacks are forced to lead. We will have campaign posters and, and contribution pots available at the back of the classroom if you're, uh, if you're interested in, in um, participating in, in that uh, obvious discrimination that is going on here. Now, I've had a little bit of fun here. Um, beware for sure that we not uh, engage in what is called anthropomorphism, and that is attributing human characteristics to subhuman organisms. I've had a little fun with the story, as you can appreciate, but in fact, the elements of the story that I wove for you is exactly what those stickleback fish do in order to mate. The description of that overlaid on top of the, the bee communication system and the, and the imprinting behavior lead, led to the development of more general ethological principles, and those are what I wanted to, to uh, spend a little bit of time with you on right now. Um, because of the truth value of the story that I was basically spinning for you. The principles that are involved are the following. One is what's called fixed action pattern. By any other name, we would call that an instinct. Okay? It is essentially um, an instinctive, complex kind of behavior that the organism exhibits. The stickleback actually exhibited eight different fixed action patterns in the course of the, of the description that I gave to you of the male's activity. The female had fewer activities, but hers were also automated. They were also fixed action patterns that were involved. What holds them all in line is what are called releasing mechanisms. That is, for instance, for the male stickleback, what caused him to go seek a female uh, for eggs was the fact that he had a nest built. Until the nest is built and ready for use, he does not go out looking for a female and doesn't swim at and get in the face of females. So in essence, the nest, the completion of the nest, becomes a releaser for go get a female. Okay? Once the female is found, the releaser for returning to the nest is that she follows him. She doesn't follow him, he's going to keep coming around and getting in her face. Okay? So that in essence, you've got a releasing mechanism, a releaser, a releasing stimulus. It's variously labeled in, in the literature. But in essence, the, the third element and the most controversial aspect of, of the um, um, ethologist's work has been the concept of what's called action-specific energy. In essence, what the ethologists have argued is that, that organisms hold in reserve a certain amount of energy specifically for the performance of each of the elements in a hierarchy like I've described for you. That has not been well defined or demonstrated. One of the problems being that organisms who get into a dead fight, a deathly fight, the implication would be of, of the action-specific energy that they would die with a certain amount of energy held in reserve. There's basically no evidence that that's the case. If an animal is threatened with death, it will use every ounce of energy that it has to resist. And finally then, the last element of this theory uh, is the logical element that has to be there, though they haven't been able to identify it. But it's clear that there are certain blocks to activity that are part of the, of the hierarchy of, of urges that the, the fish, for instance, carries around within him or her. And that is that when the male is in the process of building the house, it is not out soliciting a female at the same time. When it's trying to find a female, it's not building the house, it's not swimming to the nest. It is trying to get her attention so that she will follow. Once she's following, that then releases the swimming back to the nest. But somehow, the swimming back to the nest is blocked. We don't know how that's accomplished, but in fact it is clearly going on in this, um, in this situation. Now, what I'd like to do at this point is to step back and look at the various theories of motivation that have been developed down through the years and comment on some of them in ways, in some cases, that we already have. One of the oldest theories of, of motivated behavior is what's called a drive reduction theory. What drive reduction theory basically argues uh, is, was developed by, originally by Clark Hull at uh, Yale University back in the 1930s and 1940s. And he basically came up with a concept, a theory of, of motivated behavior, a stimulus response theory that involved, first of all, the use of drives, which I'm going to define for you a little later, but essentially it's a, it's a source of energy. Secondly, habits. The habits are what we learn when we, when we practice something over and over again. Learning results in habits is what Hull is, is basically arguing. And excitatory potential or behavior essentially is a, is a multiplicative combination of habit and drive. But in essence, this theory operates under the presumption that you and I are working to reduce drives. When we get hungry, we work to reduce the hunger is core to this theory. The problem with that is legion. There are several problems, as have been demonstrated in the last uh, 40 or 50 years. One of them, I will point out to you, is the principle of latent learning. The fact that you and I can learn by watching or by observation. 
There's no drive that we have to watch. We may do it out of habit, but there's no drive to watch, and no drive is reduced by learning what somebody does simply by watching them. So the whole issue of observational learning is an argument against drive reduction theory. Question? What if curiosity is actually a drive? I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, curiosity may be a drive, but, but certainly when you're in the midst of, of a uh, sophomore uh, English vocabulary memorization task, curiosity would be in the remote horizon as a driving force, and certainly not enough to warrant the amount of energy that you would, you would expend on it. Okay? But for a variety of different reasons, there are better ways to explain behavior than purely a reduction in drive. A second one is the, is the work of Harry Harlow involving the macaque monkeys. You'll remember when we talked about that work that in essence those monkeys, given a choice between a number of different mothers offering different features, the monkeys unanimously chose the mothers that were physically comfortable. That is, they opted for physical contact comfort rather than milk. Okay? That's very hard to explain in terms of a drive reduction model of behavior because there is nothing more central to your and my survival than food. And yet the monkeys, given the choice between food or a mother that was physically comfortable to wrap around, would prefer the one that's warm and comfortable to, to be in physical contact with. The third problem was the work of James Olds identifying what is now called the pleasure center in the brain. That's an area of the brain where when an electrode is implanted, a monkey will stand in a Skinner box and bar press until it literally drops from exhaustion rather than go eat, rather than go sleep, rather than go avail itself of, of sex or anything else. So it is clear that that is a supremely important experience within the, the brain of the, the monkey, within the, the life space of the, of the, of the uh, rat, I mean. Um, and in that case, um, what's happening is an increase in activity. That is, the, the rat's bar pressing there eventually leads to a stimulation, an increase in activity in the brain, not a decrease. And finally then, um, the whole idea that children play is very difficult to describe and defend in terms of a drive. It just, there's no, there, there is not a drive to play that we can identify. There's certainly no deprivation that, that occurs if a child isn't allowed to play. They don't have to play more because they haven't played in, in a while. Um, they're not going to suffer loss of sleep if they don't get to play, if they're kept busy in school or something else. So the point is that for a variety of reasons, drive reduction theory has simply been eliminated. Uh, we no longer uh, use that to explain motivated behavior. The second possibility goes very far in another direction. Where drive reduction theory has a fairly heavy physiological component to it, expectancy value theory has no physiology in it at all. It is entirely a learning-based theory. And it starts out with a couple of fairly simple concepts, like a motive, which is basically just a reasonably consistent ability to achieve pleasure from a particular class of incentives, whatever that may be. Um, the abilities and the motives that we have are going to differ from person to person but the, the, um, the satisfaction is an element in that. The two, one of the two key values here, or, or concepts, is expectancy. In essence, what expectancy represents is your subjective estimate of the likelihood of success. Okay? You and I are not going to go play um, a round of basketball with Hakeem Olajuwon, um, simply because he is a professional and very good at what he does, and we would not bet you know, the house on, on being able to outscore him. All right? Our expectancy of success would be very low in that case, and because of that, the likelihood that we would engage in that kind of a game, other than for the intrinsic value of it, would be very low. In addition to expectancy, we also have to assign value to the objects that we're striving for. We will work harder to date an attractive person than we will an ugly person. We will work harder for a good meal of our favorite food than we will of one that involves foods that we don't particularly like. So the value of the object also impacts how we're going to behave. And finally then, all of this is predicated on the fact that it's within the response availability of the organism. An organism can't do what it can't do. So basically this is limited to the behavioral capabilities of the specific organism. Now let's give you a specific example here of what we mean by response availability. We're talking simply about methods for reaching a goal. That's the way we define it. What am I talking about here? Well, let's pick a specific example in your everyday life. When dating, one of the key early maneuvers is a decision about when to make the first move for a kiss. To kiss or not to kiss, that is the question. Whether it is noble, well, we won't get into that. Um, one possibility is the thrill of victory. That's what you're going for, right? The whoopee effect. But there is the possibility that he or she will belch, check their watch, say, oh, a meeting, and leave when you make the move. 
That would be embarrassing, humiliating, we might say. You and I don't like that. We don't work to embarrass ourselves under any condition. So let's see what's happened. Let's suppose that our expectancy right now is about 0.8 because the dinner that we've invited our guest out on has been going very well. It's a good restaurant. We all like the food. The conversation's been sparkling. He or she has laughed at her or his jokes and so forth and so on. It's been going very well. So the momentary estimate is, I think 0.8, if I go for it, I'm going to be successful here. We'll put that on the docket for tonight. The value of a kiss is 100 points. So you've got 80 points right now in your mental register of expectancies saying, go for it. Now's the time. Do it. However, there is that point two there, that nagging thought that maybe it won't work. Point two leads to a lot of restraint on dates. That's a negative 500. We do not like to embarrass ourselves. And so in this case, what you've got is a negative 100 points saying, don't go for it. We add the two together, and the balance at the moment is a negative. Therefore, we are not going to make the kiss at this point, the move for the kiss at this point. Now, all of a sudden, your significant other snuggles down into your arms and goes, <sighs> instantly, 0.8 becomes 0 0.99, 0 0.2 plummets to 0 0.01, and when you do the math, the likelihood now is very strong that he or she will make the move. The point here is that in this theory, values, I'm going to argue, are relatively stable. Okay, whoever was your favorite person last night likely is still your favorite person today. The one exception to that, of course, is treachery. If somebody deals with you in a treacherous manner, they can lose points very rapidly, but that's unusual. Um, most of us are reasonably upfront in, in our personal relations. Um, value, or expectancy, on the other hand, is momentarily adjustable. Witness the example I just gave you. <clears throat> so this theory has a relatively stable element to it, the values which we shape during the course of our lives, and the expectancies which you and I are constantly adjusting. So what we do at any given time is basically a, a joint combination of expectancy and value. We're going to see a practical example of this a little bit later in this segment of material um, in the next lecture or two, as you, as you will see. The third approach that has been developed is what's called a hierarchy of needs. This one combines a little of both of the other two. It has some physiology, uh, but this is the work of Abraham Maslow in developing what is called a hierarchy or triangle of needs. What this triangle involves is, first of all, uh, physiological needs. He argues that essentially in the hierarchy that I'm going to develop for you here, until the lowest level needs are satisfied, the upper level needs are not even worried about, let alone worked on. Okay? So he argues that, that safety needs are secondary to basic physiological needs. Until hunger and thirst have been taken care of, you don't worry about personal safety. A number of years ago, five or six years ago, there was a boat that left one of the coastal African countries in the middle of a horrendous drought, headed south, massively overloaded, but seeking water and supplies, help for the, for the food for the people. The target country got word that the boat was coming and refused entry. And the result was that the boat was anchored about two miles from shore off the coast of this country that had the food that was necessary, uh, while the United Nations and the United States and other concerned countries and the two nations involved haggled with each other about whether the people were or were not going to be allowed on, on, on shore. The boat very quickly exhausted its supplies because it had been stocked for a three or four day journey. And in fact, when it got into the second week, they ran out of food and water and the sanitation facilities were, were overflowing. What happened was that some 300 or more of those individuals simply launched themselves off the boat in an attempt to swim to shore. Because they had, you know, and in, in essence what happened was that over half of those were ultimately killed in the attempt, died in the attempt. Um, because a significant number of, of those that jumped were unable to swim. And so in that case it was a classic example of where safety needs were sacrificed in the interest of matching or monitoring responding to unmet physiological needs. The third is love and belongingness, which interestingly enough is stocked, stabilized below esteem. That's how it is that country clubs in Houston can in some cases get away with entry fees of something approximating $100,000 to be initiated into some of the primest of prime country clubs in the country. Okay, Sororities and fraternities do the same thing here. <coughs> Several years ago, I had a student who was one of our cheerleaders, and she came into class one day wearing a sandwich board which said on it, do not ask me about my most embarrassing date. And the net result was in that case, of course, that she spent the entire day talking about her most embarrassing date. That date involved 
a date with a football player. One of her friends had, had known that she was interested in one of the football players and arranged a date for them. They went out to a dinner. She was wearing, as she describes it, a beautiful yellow dress. I guess this is the right shirt to talk about this today. Um, wearing a beautiful yellow dress. Um, very early in the dinner, she spilled a great big blob of, of ketchup on the dress. And even though it was cleaned up, there was still this very distinct kind of orangey red stain on the dress, which was with her the rest of the evening. So through the restaurant meal, through the dance that they went to after the sorority fraternity mixer, she had this big glop of, of X uh, ketchup on her. And as she described it, it was a very humiliating experience for her. Um, and the, the couple eventually survived it, but she did not like to talk about it. Um, and in essence, the sorority could get away with that. Because in essence, what they're doing is, is counting on the, the, um, the triangle that I'm in the process of building for you here. That is, they know at some gut level that people will sacrifice their self-esteem in order to belong to a group. And that's exactly how sororities and fraternities get away with the initiations that they do, which are really quite clever in some cases. But it all comes back to Maslow's hierarchy here. The final and top level, then, is self-actualization, where you are, are essentially uh, expressing your potential in its most complete form benefiting the world and drawing from the world in the maximally beneficial way. His use of the triangle is deliberate. The point is that not many people reach self-actualization. The vast majority of people are down in the lower levels and never get to the point where they can actually self-actualize. His example of people who have self-actualized would include people like um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, Albert Einstein. Those are not your run-of-the-mill people. And in essence, his point is that relatively few people actually get to that, uh, to that point in their, um, in their maturation. Finally then, today, let's start looking at the physiological motives. And we'll start out by looking at, at a drive, which I'm going to define for you now as an amount of energy available for goal-directed um, behavior. And in essence, when we look at that, some rather interesting questions then come up. One issue, for instance, has to do with the concept called homeostasis. Homeostasis is basically a self-correcting mechanism within us. I'll give you an example. Uh, temperature control in you and I is homeostatically controlled. If we get hot, we perspire. Movement of air theoretically causes evaporation, which leads to cooling. If we get cold, we get chilled. Are you aware of what happens when you get goosebumps, by the way? What actually happens is the hairs, the, the muscles under the hairs on your body, or where the hairs at one time were attached, constrict. And that produces the irregularity on the skin. On an animal like a dog or cat, it stands the hair up on end. So if you pick up your pet after he or she has been outside when it's really cold, you know, in the 40s, you will find that they're much fluffier. And the reason they do that is they stand the hair up so that they create a dead air insulation space in the, in the fur. The body heats the air, but because the fur is there, it doesn't tend to blow away. And so they've insulated themselves very effectively in that, um, in that way. That's a homeostatic mechanism. Our temperature goes too high, one thing happens. Our temperature goes too low, another happens. So it's held in a very tightly constricted uh, range. Salt balance, sugar balance, carbon dioxide oxygen ratios, I mean, you name it. There are a whole bunch of homeostatically controlled mechanisms in our body. The question then is, um, which of the drives that we might talk about is actually the strongest, is actually the most powerful? There have been several attempts to answer it, some good, some not so good. A not so good one involved what's called the Columbia obstruction box. To create such a box, what you do is start with three chambers. You have, first of all, a start box. You have, secondly, a goal box. And thirdly, you have them separated by an electrified grid. And in essence, what we're going to do is to put a rat on one side and a goal object for that rat on the other side. So in this instance, what we've done is put Mama on the left and Junior on the right, running back and forth, Mommy, Mommy. The question is, how many times when that grid is electrified, how many times will the rat cross the grid to get to the goal object? Okay. Now here's where, well, where value shows up. If it's an ugly child, Mom is going to kick back, oh, the hell with it. If it's a beautiful child, Mom is likely to make many trips. So go home and ask your mom how many trips she would have made for you, and we'll see what, uh, see what you learn. The point here is that the, the independent variable is going to be what drive are we going to have operating in this rat. So in this case, what we're doing is testing the maternal drive. And in this apparatus, it turns out the maternal drive is the strongest. The maternal drive in the Columbia obstruction box generates almost 23 crossings, a little more than 22 crossings. Okay. 
first is the second most powerful drive, and that generates a little more than 20 crossings. Hunger is the next most powerful drive, and that generates a, a little more than 18 crossings. Sex is the fourth most, fourth most powerful drive, that generates a little under 14 crossings. And idle exploration, just basically I wonder what's over there, will cause a rat to, char to charge across there only about six times before it says basically, no, I'm going to stay here. Okay? Now, that looks like a fairly impressive and easily defensible list. The problem is that there are two serious problems with that kind of apparatus, and I can describe both of them for you right here. The first problem is that the goal is visible. Nobody has rated the attractive qualities of a child to a mother relative to a stack of food to a 23-hour food-deprived rat. So given that the, vi the, the goal objects were always visible over there, there's no way to quantify, there's no way to be sure that it's the drive that we're actually measuring. Because it may simply be the attractive qualities of the goal object which are pulling the organism across rather than anything internal which is driving it across. Okay? So one problem with this is the fact that the goal object was always in sight and there was never an independent rating of the, of the attractive qualities of the goal object. The other and in some ways more serious problem is the fact that um, there's no way to specify the equitability of the drive that has been created in the rat. I can shape it for you in the following way. Assuming we just separate the mother rat by 18 inches of electric grid from her child, how driven is that rat, or put it another way, how many hours would we have to deprive a, f a rat of food in order to make him or her equally driven to the mother when it's trying to get to its child? So the second, and I would argue bigger problem with this, is that we don't have an independent assertion uh, assessment of how strong the drives are that we've actually elicited. So for a variety of reasons, this, this uh, apparatus and the conclusion generated out of it has basically been cast aside. It's simply, although it looked okay, it didn't generate good results. Just so you don't worry about it, I wanted to assure you that mom did get across to junior, so they're happy again and, and going on with their rat life. Now, the second possibility is that we ask the question in a different way. And here you get a fairly defensible set of answers. What is the impact on the organism if we fail to respond to a need? In that case, the number one drive immediately is temperature control. You have only fractions of a second in which to respond to, to too much heat. And as you know, if your temperature as an adult gets up to 105, you're going to be in an ambulance headed to the hospital. Because where a baby can tolerate 105, you and I as adults cannot. That is life-threatening. So temperature really is, is a very important drive to us, and we start doing immediate damage to ourselves if we don't respond in, in the situation where where the temperature gets too high. The second one then is breathing. As you know, we have about a three to four minute window during which we can survive without air. We don't like to, but we can. Um, pilots rising out of London to defend uh, England during the Second World War sometimes flew to the point of exhaustion of oxygen supply. If they weren't paying attention when they were flying high without an oxygen mask on, they crashed, they died because of deprivation of oxygen. So breathing is number two, having a slightly longer window of, of tolerance. Number three may surprise you, but it's the need to eliminate. The reason for that is actually very specific, and that is that you can sit there cross-legged and grin only so long, and then you are going to go to the bathroom. Social preferences uh, don't ma doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the rules say, you're going to go to the bathroom. And the reason is that the holding tanks in our body are of fixed size, limited capacity. And if that capacity is exceeded, what's going to happen is the waste products are going to back up into and hinder basic physiology of the body, the basic metabolic processes of the body. The body won't let that happen. So in fact, the need to eliminate is, is number three. Number four then is, um, is fatigue. There was one announcer on record who went over a week, almost into the second week, in a radio show in New York trying to, to uh, stay up continuously to solicit funds for a charity. The last several days they had to be talking to him constantly in order to keep him awake, but, but fatigue will eventually overcome you and is self-correcting. Fifth is thirst. We do need to drink. You can actually go longer um, without water, I'm sorry, without food than you can without water. So the actual sixth in terms of potential danger is hunger. That is, 
there's a limited length of time that you can go without food. You can go longer without food than you can without drinking. I love to hit this just at noontime. Beautiful, well-roasted chicken or turkey and let you salivate on that. We will let you sink into salivation um, and pick it up next time looking at hunger as the sample physiological motive.